Welcome to Good Game Pocket Edition, our weekly review roundup. I'm Bajo. And I'm Hex. This week we explore the sprawling world of the Elder Scrolls Online. Oh, I'm fighting an awesome lizard! This one's definitely got its hooks into me already, Hex. There's so much to see and do. I know how you feel. So many quests, so little time. We'll get to that later in the show. First, let's return to Rapture in our review of Bioshock Infinite's Burial at Sea DLC. <laughs> Sometimes we walk hand in hand. Episode 1 takes us back to when Rapture was a thriving city. This time it delves even further into its 1940s setting with a kind of film noir atmosphere, where Booker is a private detective and Elizabeth the femme fatale. You can call me Elizabeth. Many of the moments throughout episode 1 felt clumsily thrown together. It almost felt like at times I was on some haunted house theme park ride watching all of these random scenes take place. I really liked it. I liked seeing Rapture at the height of its glory. That was thrilling. But mostly episode 1 serves as a solid and necessary foundation for episode 2. Yes, and happily episode 2 is a vast improvement on the first. This time, you play as Elizabeth. Oh, thank you. It begins with an idyllic vision of Paris, which I think was my favourite part of the entire DLC. Episode 2 adopts a more stealthy approach. I agree with you that Episode 2 is definitely better than Episode 1, but I absolutely think this is worth a playthrough for fans of the series, so I'm giving it 8 out of 10 rubber chickens. Yeah, there definitely were parts of this that I loved, but it's also playing with fire a little bit. Delivering this DLC as potentially the final word we'll ever have on the Bioshock franchise, I'm not sure it's going to satisfy everyone. Yes, it answers a lot of questions, but it doesn't necessarily leave you with that feeling of resolution, so I'm going to give it 6.5. So sure you'll like what you find. Over on Spawn Point, our show for younger gamers on ABC3, we took a look at Star Wars Assault Team and Cloud Built. Star Wars Assault Team is a free-to-play game that takes us back to a galaxy far, far away. But this time our heroes are using their blasters and lightsabers for some turn-based touchscreen combat. Guys, I was a bit worried after the first few levels of this game because gameplay-wise, it's pretty basic. Yeah, it does feel a little bit like a Star Wars theme park ride, doesn't it? You just cruise around on rails while the next group of enemies patiently waits their turn. I did think the gameplay settled into a better groove once I'd rescued Chewie and escaped the Star Destroyer though. I was surprised at how much fun I was actually having once I'd unlocked some of the classic characters, such as Luke Skywalker. I got excited every time I used his super move to deflect lasers back at the enemies. And getting to take on Womp Rats with a lightsaber was pretty awesome. Look, I think this game's biggest flaw is its pushy in-game purchases. I mean, they ruined it for me. At the start, you've got loads of gems and in-game coins that the game uses as its currency. But after a few hours, I felt I was locked out of most of the levels and upgrades unless I wanted to spend real money. Yeah, it's a real shame, isn't it? I reached this point in the game where I couldn't progress to later levels until I paid to upgrade my characters. And where's the fun in that? So I'm giving it four out of ten rubber chickens. It's four and a half from me. <laughs> Cloud Build is a third-person action platformer set in a surreal sky world. Using wall runs, double jumps and a boost move, you have to navigate through some very tricky levels to try and reach the safety of the exit. You play as Demi. Well, actually, you play as her subconscious. Mental integration of neural repairs is beginning. She's been injured and is now lying in a hospital bed. In between levels, she tells you a little more about what happened and the struggle she's going through. We were torn to pieces by an explosion that should never have happened. It sets a surprisingly sombre tone for a game which seems so bright and energetic. Yeah, and it's quite a beautiful and humbling message that they're trying to get across with this, isn't it? Mm, indeed. So, while I like what they were going for here, I have to say I wasn't a huge fan of the gameplay. I just found it more frustrating than fun. And don't get me wrong, I love a good challenge. I just I didn't click with this. Yeah, I have to say, though, it is exciting when everything just works and you get a really good run going. But yes, all too often the controls and camera just let you down. So many times I fell to my doom because, for whatever reason, the wall climb move just wouldn't work. I love the art style, particularly with that cel-shaded cartoony look. It's bright and colourful and really pops off the screen. And I thought that thumping soundtrack really suited the game too. But pretty looks can only get you so far, and the idea of trying to chase better times in these levels really doesn't appeal to me, so I'm giving this 6 out of 10. 
It is a fast-paced game and pretty unforgiving at times, but I think if you can master the levels and really get past those fiddly controls, it's quite a thrill, so I'm going to give it seven and a half. Mm. Alright, time to answer a question, and I think this week we've got this one from Solo Ion, uh, who is in Karakalinga in South Australia. Hello team, have you heard that the PS4 may be getting backwards compatibility support for PS1 and PS2 games? Apparently it will be rendered in proper high definition, not just upscaled like it was for the PS3. Do you have any more information regarding this? If not, please be sure to inform us on your show when this is confirmed. I don't have a PS4 yet, but I want this to be true. P.S. Have you heard of these three promising games that were recently funded on Kickstarter? Planet 3, Dragon Fin Soup, Celestian Tales Old North. I've pledged for two of them and I wish I'd chipped in for the third. So please review these when they're eventually released. Solo Ion. Well, Solo Iron, yes, we have certainly heard about the PS4 potentially getting backwards compatibility with PS1 and PS2 games. I doubt we've heard anything more than you, though. All we know is an industry insider says they have it working with some games being able to be rendered in proper 1080p. But apparently other games run terribly, so I guess they want to make sure that everything runs smoothly before officially announcing it. So fingers crossed they can get it working. Between that and streaming PS3 games, it'd give the PS4 a pretty massive library of games. Indeed. It also seems like the Xbox One might be getting 360 emulation as well. There was a Q&A session recently at a Microsoft developer conference where Frank Savage, a representative for Microsoft, said there are plans for it, but it's apparently hard to emulate the 360 hardware on the Xbox One so there's nothing solid to announce yet. It's nice to know they're looking into it, though. Yeah, I think a lot of people were really disappointed that neither console had backwards compatibility, so if they can both figure out ways of getting it working, then I'm sure that would make a lot of people really happy. Absolutely, but as always with these rumours and speculation, there's not much point getting too worked up until there's any sort of official announcement. As for those games you mentioned, I have seen a bit of Planets Cubed, which is a sci-fi Minecraft with planets and you can travel and explore around. Definitely looks interesting. I hadn't seen those other ones you mentioned, but we'll definitely keep an eye out for them. Hmm. Well, I think on that note, it's your review time. And this week, Bajo and I thought we'd let our viewers get their knives out and rip into this extraordinary terribleness that was Rambo the video game. <laughs> The hard way is fine with me. Yes, well, it's not surprising that there was a pretty negative slant to most of the reviews, like this from Shadowrend888. Probably the worst game I've ever played. Half a star. Young Gainer here echoed that sentiment, writing, Come on, the worst game ever, even worse than E.T. Half a star. Mm, cold. Troll was slightly more generous with his score and wrote, Plain terrible, one star. And Mr. Boo here clearly couldn't stand to look at it any longer, saying, I do not like it. I turned the TV off. So crap. <laughs> half a star. Yes, it truly was an appalling game and very worthy of the many half stars it received from you all. How something like that even gets made boggles my mind, Hex. Indeed. Well, that's all the questions for this week. And don't forget that if you've got a question, you can send it in here. And while you're there, why not show off your critiquing skills and post up a review or two? Hmm. All right, Hex, it's time to take a look at the game which soaked up almost all of our time this week, The Elder Scrolls Online. Grab your sword and shield, Bajo, because adventure awaits in The Elder Scrolls Online. <laughs> You begin the game as a dead prisoner. It's up to you to cleanse the land and reveal the corruption hiding beneath the veil. That is, if you're not too distracted by collecting butterflies. Oh, I just love butterflies. And generally faffing about. Look at this, look at this. <laughs> Stop him, shut up ass. No, no. <laughs> 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 We're adventurous. We're adventurous. This is the way I dance in real life. <laughs> <laughs> Look at my face. As you journey through this land, you'll encounter lots of little stories that turn into larger ones. I just felt really invested in what was going on. I followed his orders. Scrolls Online uses a phasing system, which is becoming more and more common with this genre. This means as you clear quests, NPCs and the world around you change to reflect your actions. There is this great sense of accomplishment when you have cleared an area and suddenly none of the NPCs are hostile anymore. They've just nailed that carrot on a stick thing that WoW did so well. You can just see all those abilities that you don't have yet just out of reach. 
there are four classes, and they naturally lean towards certain roles and weapon types. But by no means is your class as fixed as most RPGs. Healers can wear heavy armor, tanks can use bows, whatever works for you. Everything has a magicka and stamina balance to it, and it's fun playing with that dynamic. This game lets you play it the way you want to and rewards you for it. It does take a while for combat okay. to become interesting, but there is this moment where things suddenly just click and you go, okay, that's pretty awesome. But I actually think this combat is more fun than in the other Elder Scrolls games. Yeah, and I love that they've gone with reticule targeting. It just makes more sense. I hate tab targeting. It's also great that there's lots of AoEs to avoid and that fights can really get out of hand. All in all, for a new studio, a new game engine, and a new genre for the series, this is quite an achievement. <laughs> I'm giving it 9 out of 10 rubber chickens. I'm just hooked on the sheer amount of content in this game. For me, this is all about the stories and that freedom you have to build your character and play the way you want to. So I'm giving this 9 out of 10 rubber chickens. Well, that's it for our roundup of the week that was. Don't forget, you can tune into regular episodes of Good Game every Tuesday night, 8 30 pm, on ABC2. Yes, next week on the show, there's another fantasy world that needs conquering in Age of Wonders 3. Going from all that MMO chaos to some strategic turn-based strategy is going to be a bit of an adjustment, I yeah, think. Better get started on your brain training then. They've been working on this sequel for over a decade, so I'm expecting big things. Until next time, may all your games be good ones. Hex out. Banjo out. Banjo out.